What's up, this is Wade with Trade ATS and I have something awesome to share with you today. Almost three years ago, we released our original master pattern training video. This training now has over 2 million views and continues to help traders become profitable to this day. Also, since this video's release, we've had the privilege of working with thousands of traders from all over the world. And in that process, we've learned a few things. In this brand new updated master pattern training, I'm not only going to cover older concepts more in depth, but I'm also going to give you all of the new tips and tricks we've learned along the way. I'm also going to show you how this methodology not only works on Forex, but also stocks and cryptocurrencies. Sit back and relax because you're not going to want to miss a minute of this special training. All right, here we go. Man, I cannot tell you how excited I am to share this information with you. I put a ton of time and effort into this, uh, into this updated training, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. So let's talk about that. What are you going to get out of this training? What can you expect? You're going to learn why 95% of traders lose money and how you can do the opposite of what they do. That's the essence of what we're doing here. If you understand why money is lost in the market, then that gives you a strategy to win in the market by really understanding that. So keep that in mind. You're gonna learn how to find and follow the hidden price pattern that reveals the true intentions of financial markets. This works the same in Forex, cryptocurrencies, equities, and anything else that has a price feed and a lot of people trading it. You're gonna learn a strategy to start using this pattern right now to immediately improve your trading. Meaning when you're done watching this full training, you wanna watch it all the way to the end because there's a lot of detail here. But when you're done, you're gonna take what you learn here, you're gonna be able to go look at your charts and you'll be looking at them differently. You'll be able to find the patterns I'm gonna teach you and you're gonna immediately improve your trading. And towards the end of this training, I'm gonna give you examples of how this information can help you right now. We're actually gonna go look at some live charts, do some analysis, and I'm gonna show you how to implement this methodology right now today. So what is the master pattern? If you've been following our material, uh, whether it be on YouTube or you're subscribed to our email list, then you've probably seen this graphic before. I'm just gonna briefly cover what the master pattern is. This is a general overview. We're gonna get really, really in depth with how to apply this methodology. The master pattern is a price pattern made up of three phases that complete one market cycle. So as the market goes through one full cycle, there are three phases in the master pattern involved in creating that cycle. This pattern embodies all market participants trading activity and behavior. This includes market makers and both retail and professional traders. A professional professional trader would be like a proprietary trader on a trading desk, say at JP Morgan or, or a big bank. Um, this, everybody's behavior is involved and, and their trading decisions are involved in creating this pattern. So it covers all basis. Now this pattern happens on all time frames, every time frame from the one minute to the monthly. And it happens in all liquid markets, including Forex, stocks, commodities, and especially crypto markets. So if you're trading crypto, you really wanna pay attention to this whole training. So before I get really deep into this training, I just wanna quickly mention that this is designed to be an update for 2022 and beyond. Uh, if you've been following Trade ATS for a while, you've probably seen our original master pattern training video. Well, you can think of this as a sequel to that. Um, you can think of it as, as a follow-up uh, that's going to get deeper. You're going to learn more. It's just going to expand on that original concept. So our original master pattern training was focused on how market makers specifically operate in facilitating trade across Forex markets. So it was really focused on, on the market makers alone. Now this new 2022 training will focus not only uh, on the market makers, but on how all smart money traders have to operate to be successful in every type of market, including stocks and cryptocurrencies. So we'll have those new additions and how the master pattern plays into even those markets. All right, now we're gonna get a little deeper into the training here. So out of the following two descriptions, which description fits you best and be honest? Smart money. Smart money traders look at trading as a business that has certain requirements to operate successfully. They understand that all price movement is a result of people's emotions, beliefs, behaviors, and strategies. 
even if those beliefs are programmed into a robot or a bot. They know that it is the understanding of how those beliefs manifest in price that leads to long-term profitability. Smart money does not trade until they have a clear market catalyst that gives them an edge. Even then, they are ready to adapt their trading plan to unforeseen changes that may arise. So that's the description of smart money. Now let's look at the description of dumb money. Most dumb money traders look at trading as a money printer game that they just need the right indicator or strategy to win at. They believe that price movement is a result of their MACD crossing, or if that didn't work, it's a result of an indicator signal that they've not found yet. Dumb money can also be someone who will not take the action necessary to protect themselves because they are too emotionally invested in their trading decisions. Dumb money continually chases the next hot pick, stock, or signal service in search for the holy grail that never materializes. So out of these two descriptions, what do you feel describes you best? Like I said, be honest, and it is what it is. If you're on the right side or you find you're, you're more towards the dumb money, we're gonna fix that in this training, so no worries. And I don't mean to call anybody dumb, but I find this is an easy way to separate uh, the different groups we're gonna be talking about in this training. We're gonna use the term smart money to describe the, the, the smart players in the market and the term dumb money to describe the people that are essentially losing their money to the smart money. So um, throughout this presentation, you'll hear me refer to those two groups uh, for training purposes. I want to briefly cover a misconception that I feel exists, um, especially among retail traders. Um, this is, are only retail traders considered dumb money? The answer is no. Even large institutions or institutional traders that work for the institutions can make terrible trading decisions. It happens, retail traders make terrible trading decisions, institutional traders can do the same thing. There's competition at every level in the market. Each has its winners and losers, or you can think of it as each level or, or uh, institution. They have their own smart money, and sometimes they act as dumb money. They make dumb decisions. There's also an increasing level of inflexibility at the institutional level, which is something I, I think this will be a little bit eye-opening for you. Let's talk about a quick example. Some institutional investment firms sell their management services based on a specific strategy or approach to the market. So when they attract investment capital or they, they try to bring in investors, they present, a lot of them present a certain way that they approach the market, the amount of risks they take, um, when they generally build positions, the markets they trade, they have a whole investment philosophy that they sell to those clients. So their customers or investors expect them to be implementing the strategy. They can follow along with the trades, they can see the performance, they expect them to be doing what they were sold. So if the overall macro market cycle changes, especially quickly, it can be very hard for a firm to change their strategy simply because it could put their clients into a panic. If all of a sudden what they were sold is not what's happening, then if you're an investor, you could be like, why are you changing? Why, why are we taking on less risk or why are we taking on more risk? Um, it's very, th there becomes a level of that inflexibility. So what's the point of discussing this? Well, if you're a retail trader, you can see how part of your edge is not having any clients to explain yourself to. You could do whatever you want. You can turn on a dime. If the market, if the environment changes, you can change your approach and go with that new market condition and you don't need to explain it to anybody except yourself. By spotting areas on the chart where dumb money is becoming active, it creates opportunity for you to do the opposite. So that's one of the big things I want you to remember in this training, okay? There's dumb money at every level in the market, depending on the decisions that were made and the time they were made. And that's what's gonna create opportunity is by really drilling down to where people are making mistakes. So keep that in mind throughout this training. So now let me pose a question. Why do most traders struggle to become profitable? Why do you think that is? Well, there's two big reasons. Number one, they're undercapitalized, and this causes them to take too big risks. So they don't have enough money, they need to make their trading worth it, they trade too much money, they lose money. That's number one. Number two, they do not understand dumb money's role in supply and demand, 
and how tracking and taking advantage of their mistakes, dumb money's mistakes, is the only way to make consistent gains. You have to fill your trading account with the losses of people that have made mistakes. So it makes sense to track when those mistakes are likely being made. So I will address the first problem in another lesson. That's a whole topic uh, under capitalization. That's a whole nother topic and how to, how to fix that. This training is going to teach you how to fix the second problem. Now fixing this problem will help you no matter what your account size is. So here's a slightly depressing fact you may or may not be aware of. 95% of all deposited funds for trading are lost given enough time. These funds are transferred to the top 5% of traders. The big question is, why does this happen? Why is this statistic the way it is? Well, one reason is because traditional indicators mask market cycles. And that's what this training is all about, is teaching you about market cycles. So when a retail trader you know, or any trader comes into the market for the first time, the first thing they're going to be hit with is the, uh, the free indicators that are av available on the dealing platform, whether it be TradingView or MetaTrader 4 or whatever. They're going to see Bollinger Bands. They're going to see MACDs. They're going to see moving averages. They're going to probably start messing with trend lines and Fibonacci's and everything else out there. So these indicators can be tailored through the settings to look like they work great. But the problem is, if you've traded for any length of time, you've probably experienced this, is that eventually those settings start to not work. Maybe uh, a setting that worked in a really heavily trending market now doesn't work when the market starts going sideways. So you have to constantly keep optimizing the, the indicators to try to figure out what works. And by the time you get the optimization right, the market cycles have changed. What was, what was a trending market is now a sideways market or vice versa. So this is a big frustrating never-ending circle of system development that retail traders typically go through and this can last them for years um, and can be sometimes the single reason that puts them out of the business because they just don't want to deal with the constant changing systems anymore. So this is a major problem. So going along with this, why do traditional base indicator systems fail over time? Again, the short answer is the markets move in cycles that constantly change structure. Traditional indicator systems must be constantly optimized because of the changing market environment. There are an infinite number of variables that affect price, so no exact technical system can work the same forever. This is the reason that robots fail, because they're programmed a lot of times based off of these indicator settings. If you understand the sequence of real cycles that drive markets and are able to spot them, you can more accurately forecast market behavior. So even if you want to use indicators like moving averages or MACDs, if you first understand market cycles and the market phases that never change, then you'll be even better equipped to use those indicators. Here's the exact same chart we were just looking at, the one that had the Bollinger Bands and the MACD on it. But instead, we're going to look at it from a market cycle perspective. You can see that we have blue candles, we have red candles, we have green candles, and you can see if we have the numbers one, two, three. This is the constant progression of looking at the market phases, which equal the market cycle. This is all we're looking for all the time. We're looking for phase one, which is that contraction phase. Phase two, which is the expansion. When we leave contraction, this can take many forms but it's always the expansion from contraction. And then we have phase three, which is the trend, which is where price travels from lower to higher prices or higher to lower prices and starts over with that contraction phase. So this is it. And these phases have characteristics that never change. They might slightly change shape. They might change the time they take to play out, but the characteristics are always the same. So that's what this, this train is gonna teach you uh, throughout from here till the end. It's going to teach you what these characteristics are and how to find these on a chart. And then with this repeatable one, two, three process, you're really going to empower yourself to forecast market behavior and direction. Big money players have problems. The institutions, the hedge funds, 
all those guys, they got problems. You might be thinking, what kind of problems can they have? They control the world. They're rich. Well, let me explain. Big money, the ones who really move markets, have a problem. They need much more liquidity than you or I do as retail traders to enter and exit their trades. They also need time to fill these trades. When you're trading billions and billions of dollars, you can't just get in and out of the market on a minute by minute basis like a retail trader can. When a retail trader trades, they're trading size that they're just typically trying to make a living that they're comfortable with. This isn't moving around billions of dollars. So there's always liquidity typically to fill a retail trader's positions. Not for these big institutions. They have to plan things out very carefully to make sure that there's liquidity not only to get in at a good price without spiking the market, but they also need to make sure there's liquidity to get out so they can actually take those profits out of the market. Let me explain this a little further with an example. Think about this. If you work for Apple, could you personally sell, let's say 10 next generation iPhones at a tech conference? There's a bunch of techie people there. You have this brand new iPhones, probably not even in stores yet. You could probably sell 10 of them easily. This may be a great weekend of sales for you, especially if you're on commission, but Apple can't survive off of only selling 10 iPhones. They need to sell millions of these things to make the profits that they need to survive and thrive as a company. This means that they need to invest in inventory beforehand. They, they need to have millions of these devices ready to go to stores, and they need to know that there's going to be a market to sell their next-gen iPhone to. And knowing Apple, they, sit, they don't seem to have too many problems with demand for their products. Now, big market players, people that are trading the markets, managing big funds, they have to think the same way to move their money around and actually have an edge. They have to strategize and plan for demand in the market or supply in the market that's favorable. Now, market cycles provide them perfect opportunities to trade the size they need to. Remember I told you that the, the master pattern, it encompasses all trading behavior? Well, the, the master pattern provides these big hedge funds and these big institutions liquidity that is favorable for them to fill their trades to get in the market and get out of the market. Let me explain a little further. So let's get back into how the markets really work. So I want to briefly walk you through kind of how the, the fundamental cycle of positive news, negative news, how that comes through the mainstream and affects supply and demand. Now, this is going to be kind of a higher time frame thing that I'm, that I'm going to be explaining to you. So if you're looking for this to play out on your charts, this is something that, that you're going to see typically on the daily, weekly, uh, or monthly macro time frame charts. So keep that in mind that the time frame of this playing out is, is usually a little bit higher. So let's start with a new paradigm. A new paradigm can be a new IPO for a, a stock that's coming out that everyone's excited about. You could think like Robinhood or um, you know something along those lines. Something that's exciting, it's drawing people in, um, they they're, have high hopes, right? So that's a new paradigm. It, this could also be like a new crypto token or cryptocurrency, um, you name it. But it's bringing, it's attracting excitement and investment in the market. Eventually, unfavorable news in the in the life cycle of that new technology or stock unfavorable news is going to hit the mainstream and this will cause the price to move down now this is a key part when the price moves down dumb money weak hands weak holders are typically going to start panicking to some level depending on how aggressive the move down is this is key because as that dumb money sells smart money accumulates inventory remember we were talking about these uh, big investment firms that need to move billions of dollars, you know, that they have to make a return on a much bigger sum of money, they need those favorable prices. So not only is the price down, but they have weak hands that are willing to give up their supply. That allows the smart money to accumulate supply for them at a discounted price. So you could see how it's much easier to accumulate rather than after the price has already moved up. So let's keep going. Eventually, the sell-off is going to cool. If the overall fundamentals haven't changed, uh, if people are generally still excited about this, once the price stops cratering, now they're like, okay, you know, the bloodbath is over, and you know, it's 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 neutralized at that point. But but remember, the dumb money has already given up their supply. They've given up that that level of control. 
So eventually in the life cycle, we're gonna get some positive news. There's gonna be something favorable that comes through mainstream channels and that is gonna start having the price move up. It's gonna help the price move up. Now what's happening? Dumb money starting to get interested because there's nothing that draws weak hands into the market like the campaign of price moving up. When they see it going up, they feel like I can believe it, it's happening. They need that that ultra confirmation. And now they're they now they want to get invested. So as then price continues to move up, what's happening? Dumb money is now starting to buy into the rally and smart money is selling to the same people that they accumulated their supply from. Generally, it might not be the exact same person, but you get what I mean. In general, the price moved down, dumb money panicked, smart money accumulates, providing that the fundamentals are still good. You know, if it's if the whole idea or the whole industry is falling apart, that's a different story. But if it's still good, d- smart money accumulated from d- dumb money at the bottom of the cycle, and smart money then sells to the same people as they rush into the market, um, which will... Over the long term, this may work out for them sometimes where they buy into a spike and end up getting, you know, making a profit. But over, if you do that over and over again, you will come out with with net losses, if not lose all your money Um, because the trade placement is weak. When dumb money is swamping the market as it's going up, they are, they are only buying with a bunch of other dumb money typically. So it's only weak hands left propping up the market. And the minute that that price starts to go down, all the weak hands collapse, and that's why you get these huge rallies and these huge um, these huge dumps. So, anyway, that's kind of the general cycle, and you could kind of think of it uh, in this way: that that the dumb money flows into the market, that this is kind of like the fuel of this system. The dumb money flows, and then the smart money grows from that flow. Because the, the, the smart money is able to accumulate at good prices and then they know they have willing customers to sell to as the prices go back up. So based on that understanding of how the markets really work, we've come up with this golden rule. The golden rule to trading smart. Never enter a trade until you've accumulated your position from someone who made a mistake. The big question is, how do you know when other traders have probably made a mistake? Well, the rest of this training is going to teach you how to map out your charts and find those sensitive areas where traders are likely making a mistake and you can accumulate those positions from them. The biggest key in understanding whether you're getting a good deal on your inventory or not is defining true market value. This is the most important part, so really pay attention here. Value, also known as a contraction phase, is the future tipping point between bull and bear controlled markets. Value is confirmed when price settles into a range between a previous high and low point. So after the the end of a a previous move, you have the end of a previous trend, you're going to have this neutral zone that gets trapped between the previous high and low point. So it kind of settles into that area. When this happens, it means that buyers and sellers have temporarily agreed on fair market value on the higher time frames. This is why price has stopped trending. This is why it settled into this point. Now the average price of the contraction area paints forward as market framework to forecast market behavior and opportunity. So it's that average price or value line that shows you the tipping point between overbought and oversold markets. Going a little bit deeper here, how value defines framework. Again, buyers and sellers agree on value based on the contraction area. Trading will oscillate around value until the higher time frame players take control of the market and a trend breaks out. Now pay attention to this because this is a big key of why the strategy works so well uh, and this general understanding of the market. The value area and subsequent average price line is organically created through real price activity. So it's the, the price activity in the market between buyers and sellers that confirms the value area, not something that we just arbitrarily impose on the market. So it's really important that the market itself is defining these areas. This is why it becomes such a reliable reference point in the future, even more so than Fibonacci or general support and resistance lines. This average price line is static and can never be redrawn once a market has confirmed the value area. So once you have a true confirmed value area, it's there for good 
and that price will become significant in the future as the market oscillates and interacts with that point. So looking at a quick screenshot from our software on TradingView, you can see that value makes up the backbone of market structure. Um, this is on BTC USD daily chart here pretty recently. You can see the white lines. Those are what we call expansion lines, but those are the value lines that our software draws. And you can see how they become significant price points in the future. That literally is the structure of the market and the market oscillates and works within those points. And if you know what those points are, you can see how you can not only forecast opportunities, but you can also manage positions and move around accordingly to how the market interacts with those points. Before we move on, I just wanna make one more thing clear. Yes, we do have software that maps out this process. The software does make it easy to do this analysis because it just automatically does it all for you. But let me be clear in saying that you do not need our software and I am not trying to sell you a software through this. I'm genuinely trying to teach you this methodology. After watching this whole thing, you'll be able to follow this methodology and map this out on your charts by yourself. Um, you don't need a tool to do this. So like I said, it makes it easier. Um, if you want to learn more what, about what we do with the software program, you, know, you can find more at, at tradeats.com, but you do not need a uh, software to do this. Now, going back to the circle graphic where I showed you the fundamental process of how smart money is always accumulating from dumb money and then selling back to them, I want to go deeper now into what that looks like in price action, not just the circle graphic, but what it actually looks like and how you can interpret that. Again, we start with that all-important value point, the true market value. You can see we have two little blue guys in there, and that's basically showing that it's neutral. There's agreement. That's why the market has stopped and is kind of oscillating sideways in a tight range. Okay, remember, smart money sells above value. They sell their inventory, and then dumb money buys as the market rises. When you get below the tipping point of value, now smart money begins to buy, they start to build their inventory, and dumb money sells because they're in a panic, right? So let's watch how this happens. As a market goes up, when we're above value, dumb money's buying, smart money says, no problem. Here, I have inventory to sell you. Smart money sells to them. Now we're below value. Who's red? That's the dumb money. Now they're selling because they think, okay, the markets are, are for sure going down now. Smart money matches that. They say, okay, well, you want to give up your inventory? I'll take it because smart money knows that the markets are undervalued at this point. Again, dumb money sells as the market goes further. Smart money says, thank you very much. I'll take that inventory off your hands. Now price comes back up. Dumb money buys. Smart, smart money says, hey, I have inventory. I can sell you. Here you go. Again, markets keep going. Dumb money buys. Here's some more inventory that I got from you undervalued. <laughs> Again, goes up. Smart, uh, dumb money buys, smart money sells. Thank you very much. Here's some inventory, still demand in the market. Dumb money demand still there. Smart money sells into that demand. So I know this is a simplistic thing, but I'm really trying to drive this home that if, you, if you're following the charts of what the dumb money, the, the laggards are doing and where the best prices were to accumulate inventory, uh, and where the best prices will be to liquidate that inventory. When you're looking at it from that bird's eye view, you can see this process and it helps you understand what is likely going on so that you know whether there's an advantage or not at in any given time, or you know likely what kind of business is being done on the chart. Now, something you might be thinking that I wanna cover is, well, some of those dumb money traders saw a profit. Wouldn't they have the opportunity to make money even if they were chasing the market? And I'm sure we all know somebody that maybe bought a stock. Maybe it was like Tesla. You know, when Tesla went parabolic and started going up, it seemed like everybody was making money on Tesla and you didn't need to know anything, right? Now, would you say that that's the rule or the exception? I bet if you've been trading for any amount of time, you know that that's the exception. It's not the rule, right? Um, so the answer is yes, but most do not take their profits off the table. And I believe it's because of this simple concept. Let me explain. Pain and pleasure. A lot of people will say that the markets are controlled by fear and greed. I think it's pain and pleasure. I think fear and greed have their place, but pain and pleasure I think is more powerful. Let me explain. Pleasure. When a trade is in profit, it feels good. Think of your last good trade. When you saw that you, your P&L was going up, you weren't upset about it, right? You felt great. You felt like you made a good decision. 
you really don't want that good feeling to end, right? Traders don't want that good feeling to end. They want it to keep going to the moon, right? So what ends up happening is that that feeling, when something feels good, it causes us to not be very decisive in our action. Yes, we should take the profit off the table, but what if it keeps going? You know, what if what if I miss out on a really, really big move and I get out too early? These kinds of things you think about when you're in profit. Think of all the people who got caught holding the bag on Bitcoin at the high in 2017 before the crash. Why didn't they all sell at the top? Yeah, maybe there was a handful of people that just happened to call the top right, but was that was that the rule or was that the exception? I think it was the opposite. Did you not have people buying Bitcoin like crazy at 18, 19,000? Especially because as it's going up parabolic, you have all these influencers and people saying, you know, they're throwing out numbers like it's going to 50,000, it's going to 100,000, 250,000, you know, next month. Um, so that's the kind of mania you get when things go parabolic like that. And that's not going to cause your average trader to want to take profits off the table. So what ends up happening? That rally ended, right? Yes, it's come back recently, but that particular rally ended hard and fast. So what people saw on paper as profits is not likely what they took home. In fact, the people that got in close to the top, when it was really, really the, the mania was draw, drawing everybody in, when the when it was at its at its uh, at its peak there, a lot of those people lost big, right? So let's look at the opposite now, pain. When a trade goes out of the money, it causes pain. Think of the people that bought BTC at 19,000. They were in pain pretty quick after that. They were out of the money. Now the pain intensity is determined by how much risk was taken and or the quality of trade placement within the master pattern cycle, right? So if somebody mortgaged their house, took money out of it, and put it all into, into BTC at 19,000 in 2017, right where they were they were pretty heavily leveraged if they're losing that money they're going to be very upset they're going to want to pull that out of the market very quick cuz their their pain threshold is very low also the trade placement within the master pattern cycle if someone had great trade placement towards the bottom of that bull run they weren't feeling the same kind of pain they might have saw a huge amount of profit but they started feeling pain as of the price started coming back at them in that hard fast crash so again pain is a motivator to get us to take decisive action. When we feel pain, we usually take immediate decisive action to make it stop. This means closing a trade with a loss. You could think of a, a little boy or a little girl. They don't have to be told to stop pain. It's just something that we're born with. If they touch a hot stove, they know, ow, that doesn't feel good, make it stop. So this is something, this is why it's so easy to lose as a trader. It's literally a natural response. We don't like seeing money being lost. We're like, we need to make the stop, close the trade, right? So since the markets are in contraction or the expansion phase 90% of the time, this means that they're basically ranging sideways 90% of the time. If that's the case, if things are going sideways overall and they're not going parabolic, this means that there's a likelihood you will experience some level of pain in 90% of your trades, wherever you enter them at. This is one of the biggest reasons traders lose money and why tracking the master pattern works so well. Because the master pattern shows you where people are getting invested at the wrong levels and it shows you where people are getting put into max pain. When you understand the master pattern, you can forecast when other traders are going to be in max pain, like I said, and this creates opportunity for you. Now let's briefly revisit this graphic, but this time we're only going to look at it from dumb money's perspective. We have our neutral zone. We have our true value line. Remember, dumb money is buying above value. Dumb money is selling below value. So right now, again, dumb money is buying above value as markets are going up. They're seeing that price campaign drawing them in. It's going to be easy for them to buy and chase that market. But this time we're going to be tracking their ultimate pain point. These points based on the master pattern, uh, based on the contraction area, this is where this is going to start. And these points, you can liken these to the stop, their stop loss levels. But what these points really are based on the master pattern is these are price points that they are ultimately going to be forced to change their mind or they are going to be highly, highly uncomfortable. 
Remember the pain and pleasure example. This is where that max pain is going to be. And this is where whether the, this, uh, this person is running a stop loss or not, I really don't care. If they bought where that green man is and then price went down as it is to that red, uh, that red level, they're not going to feel happy about it. And they're going to want to get out of that trade. And when they do, it's going to create liquidity, stop loss or not. So again, we go under value. Uh, dumb money is now being inclined to sell. They want to chase the market. All their indicators are starting to po point to the downside. Their stop loss uh, or their ultimate pain point is going to go at what we call the swing high point of the master pattern cycle. So it'll be up there uh, reflected at that high. Again, markets keep going down. That point really doesn't change. Now, I know you might be saying, well, what if they're running tighter stop losses? Or, you know, what if they just get stopped out with, with a minor loss uh, as the market's rotated? Yes, that does happen. Uh, not every single person is going to have their stop loss at this exact point. But we're talking about the ultimate point where they're going to have to recognize that markets can be reversing. Right? This is where it's, it's that ultimate point. And even if they're running a stop loss... I know we've all been in this situation, we've all made this mistake where you entered a market probably where you shouldn't, you put your stop and he says, well, I'll use a real tight stop. And then what happens, the market goes against you and you keep moving your stop and you move it and you move it and you keep moving it even though you shouldn't. Ultimately, these points that, that I'm pointing out right now are where you probably would ultimately move your, your stop loss to and then you'd be like, oh, forget it, the, the market's going against me. So that's what this is based on. So, so hang in with me or hang in there with me on that. So now we're back above value, dumb money is being buying, the indicators are all starting to point up, the moving averages, the MACDs are all going up. Now their stop loss, their ultimate pain point is gonna go at what we call the swing low point of the overall cycle. So they keep buying, markets keep going up, that point doesn't change, it just keeps getting built up and stronger. Still buying, still buying. So. That's how you track the ultimate pain points of the overall master pattern cycle in the three market phases. But one thing I wanna point out that's interesting, you may have never thought of this before. Notice that whether dumb money is opening a new trade or getting stopped out of an old trade, the same types of orders are being executed at unfavorable prices for dumb money. In this case, these buy orders are creating favorable demand for smart money to sell to. So you see that on one hand, you have a, a, the trader from the very first part of the cycle is getting stopped out where the black arrow is pointing. And you have a new dumb money trader opening a new position tr chasing the market. Either way, it's buy liquidity. So do you, it's whether they're getting stopped out or initiating a new trade. It's making the wrong transaction at the wrong price level. So, and it all creates favorable liquidity for smart money to take advantage of, whether it's for accumulation or it's for demand uh, and, and bringing that, that market price up. So really interesting thing there to, to think about. One more thing we need to consider before we get into exact strategy is how time affects the master pattern. How does it play into all this? So as time flows away from an established contraction point where we have value, the market usually becomes more and more volatile. Uh, as time goes on, as the market expands, you could see it's kind of represented by this funneling out price action. Um, this is kind of a traditional master pattern cycle. The reason this happens is because higher time frame traders are becoming active as the range size increases. As you smash high and low prices and keep it keeps breaking out, doing these are false breakouts, but it keeps breaking out. Those higher higher time frame candles are now starting to move around and build history. That's going to draw those higher time frame players in, right? So one thing that I want to teach you about this right now is that when there is indecision on higher time frames, let's say your higher time frame is in a box or it's in a contraction itself, an expansion on the lower time frames can have many swing high, swing low points. You can see that we have one, two three, four, five, six, seven. Seven uh, swing high and low points in this overall master pattern cycle. We call this a multi-leg expansion. So if you see any of our other material, you hear us say multi-leg expansion, that's what this is, okay? And this, again, this signals indecision 
on the higher time frames. If there was decision on the higher time frames, it would have bro broken out usually on the first, second, third, or, or even fourth expansion. But if you go into a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, and it's still ultimately not going where, anywhere, it's still oscillating around that original value line, you know there's indecision up on those higher time frames. So quick example, as the range size increases, traders who are looking for longer, bigger moves start to feel that the market has enough volatility to, ju to justify a trade. So as it's opening up, that range size is opening. What started on legs one and two might have been a 20 pip range, and now we're on legs uh, six and seven, and let's say that's a 50 or a 75 pip range. That's a pretty big move, right? For the higher time frame players, this means their candles are moving around, and that means that their different systems are likely coming into criteria and giving them their buy and sell signals or whatever they're looking for. So that higher time frame uh, activity is being drawn into the market. I briefly want to cover the concept of the scale of time frame interest and how, again, going along with the theme of how time affects the master pattern, this is also another component that I want you to understand, okay? So every time frame that traders trade represents its own group of traders according to their investment time horizon and the way they are influenced to make investment decisions. Each group has their own smart and dumb money players, right? We have our main time frames here. I know there's more time frames, but I'm trying to keep this simple. I'm, I'm sure you'll get the point. To the left, we have our monthly charts, our, our weekly charts, our daily charts, and then off to the right, we have our four hour, one hour, and 15 minute chart. So you can see we have long time frames on the left and short time frames on the right. Each of these people, let's say that you're someone that trades uh, you know, big swings in the market. You're probably gonna be looking at a monthly or a weekly chart. Now, if you're looking at those, those charts, you're looking for whatever patterns that you look for according to your system or how you approach the market. You need those candles to arrange themselves in a way that triggers you to make a decision uh, or, or you know, get in a trade, or get out of a trade, or move your stop loss. You need architecture based on those time frames. So, if someone is looking at a monthly chart, how many trades do you think they are going to to make, realistically, based off of technical analysis? Now, if there's some huge news event that comes out, um, then that day they are definitely probably going to change their, regardless of what the, their candles look like. If it's a huge fundamental change they may change their trading plan based off that. But when I'm talking about just candle pattern and, and technical analysis of all sorts, they're looking for the candles on their time frame to build in a certain way to eventually influence them to make a decision. Same thing with a 15 minute uh, chart trader. Now, a monthly trader, again, is not gonna get in and out multiple times in a day. Nothing's gonna change significantly for them. But a 15 minute trader might make multiple trades every day, right? Depending on how their approach is. So my point is, is that on the left we have slow money and last to move creates market stability. If you have a significant breakout on a monthly or weekly chart, sometimes these breakouts can literally last for months on up to years, one direction. And that's because those time frame players see no reason to change their mind. They are full blast in that direction, and that's creating stability. Literally, if, if a trade or a market goes in one direction for six months or a year and doesn't have any significant turns off of those monthly or weekly timeframes, it's because those time frame players are keeping that market stable. Whereas if you go over towards the, the right side, you have the 15 minute, the hour, the four hour. These are going to be daily traders. These are the first to move, and they create market liquidity. If, if a trader's in and out, long, short, long, short, uh, you know, multiple times per day or, or, or even per week, then they're not worried about the overall direction. They're just getting in and out on the minor swings of the market. And so the 95% winning strategy is use fast money's liquidity to profit from slow money's stability. So before you freak out and get upset with me for saying 95% winning strategy and how could that even exist and how could I say that, hear me out for a second, okay? We only say this strategy can win 95% of the time because if executed perfectly, you would be trading the exact opposite way of the 95% that lose money in the markets, providing you with near perfect success. It's literally the strategy executed perfectly is the exact mirror of why people lose in the markets. 
So understand, but that's perfect. No one is perfect. So do not expect a 95% win rate. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. No one is. You will get it wrong sometimes. This will take time and practice to understand and should ultimately help you to become profitable because you will be trading in line with how the markets really work. So my only goal for you in sharing this material is that you get on the right side of the market. You stop doing the things that people lose money from. That's it. And if you understand why money is lost, you understand the patterns that are driving the markets, it gives you the opportunity to have that insight and in certain circumstances, use it to your favor and win some trades. Now I'm going to start digging into technical strategy. So right here we have two different time frame charts. We have a daily chart on the left and a 15 minute chart on the right. Th this data is taken from the EURUSD in recent history. So this is an actual move that happened on EURUSD. So remember, slower money creates a stable direction. If you think of the daily traders, these would be traders that they are only looking at the daily as their lowest time frame to make trading decisions. Across this entire up move, the daily traders as a group did not feel the need to pull their trades out of the market um, or, or sell the market and cause selling pressure. That's why the daily continued in an uptrend during this period. The, the daily traders did not change their mind on that direction for whatever reason, right? So they kept the market stable, but within that market, that overall trend, there were these minor pullbacks on the 15 minute chart. And that is the faster money. Inside here, you get traders that are looking at the 15 minute chart and feel the need to sell it. Sometimes uh, in an aggressive move, they sell at the market, but overall the stable direction does not change because those daily traders are not selling. It's only gonna go as far as the 15 minute traders as a group are gonna be able to push it unless there was a big fundamental change, right? So it creates these opportunities. Now you might be saying, well, those just like look like pullbacks. I know what a pullback is. I could throw a moving average on there um, or, or some sort of oscillator that'll show me those pullbacks and I could enter that trend. That's no big deal. Well, that's or easier said than done, as you probably know as well. It's hard to navigate pullbacks sometimes. So what's the solution to know when to enter on a pullback and how to actually manage these opportunities. Because you know, sometimes just a moving cr average crossover in trend doesn't cut it. The market can get very, very noisy. What makes all the difference in navigating those pullbacks is having the correct market framework to manage those trading ideas by. And that's what we get with those all important value levels coming from those contraction zones. Here's the same move we were just looking at. Euro USD, here's the 15 minute. And here's the daily move we were looking at. But let's break it down a little bit more. We're gonna, I'm going to go a little bit into the analysis. We're going to start over the high, on the higher time frame right here. See, we have two contraction boxes. And these boxes are red. And so our software recognizes these as a little bit more significant uh, than a gray box would be. These are true master pattern origination points with multi-leg expansions associated with them. So we know these are gonna be significant and price is gonna to wanna to hang out here a little bit longer. So we have this first swing high, swing low, and now we're back at the swing high point. Just classic funneling out price action originating from in here where, where it tightened up. What we're looking at though is this move right here. Now let's look at the dynamics of how this move originally started. What was happening right here when you could see we got held up on value right here and then price broke through. What do these lines represent? These yellow lines represent the stop losses or remember the ultimate pain point of people that bought above value. That was their ultimate point uh, where they would start to feel really uncomfortable. Imagine if you bought up here and you're saying, uh, and you're just moving your stop loss down, moving it down, and then all of a sudden you get this aggressive move down, you're saying forget it, right? So that's pushing the market down here. That's dumb money getting stopped out. On top of that, you have dumb money chasing this market, opening new trades. It's creating, to, uh, creating the selling pressure in the market. But this didn't last. This shows us that the higher time frames weren't interested enough uh, it to, uh, to short this market at, at these prices. So it didn't carry on down. What happened instead? Smart money had the opportunity 
to accumulate at these levels as dumb money rushed in. That's why we had this aggressive move when dumb money couldn't sustain the market heading down. They couldn't keep it going. The higher time frames didn't help them out. Those weak hands dropped, and that's what gave us the, the first turn right here. And it gave smart money, again, the, the great levels to accumulate inventory at. Now the price is moving up, and this is the level that we're, that we're or this is the move that we were looking at trading within. But that, you always want to start on the higher time frame because that gives you an idea of how sustained the move is going to be. If you know where the move is within the cycle, then you can act more accurately forecast what's going to happen on the lower time frames. A daily candle that is right here, that is, is coming after this kind of market action, is going to have a different expectation than one that is clearly in a contraction phase. So hopefully you can understand the differences there. But now let's look at the move over here on the 15 minute. Now the 15 minute had all these pullbacks, remember? And we were saying, well, you know, can't you just put up moving averages to navigate these pullbacks? Well, what makes all the difference is having these management points right here. You can see when this move just started, this is down here at the bottom uh, of the daily turn. As you can see, it's right in here. Well, the market started moving up. We had a red box here, it got above. And then we had another uh, box appear right here, another contraction point, and it dropped down and it held this framework. That's what we call price settling right there. It comes down, it hits that framework, and then has a move away. That is a major clue that you're getting a more significant turn in the market. So as, as uh, after that moment, we're off to the races, the daily rotates, and here we go. Now we get another significant red box. The price action above, if you know that structure is right here, this is value, do you want to buy when it's overvalued? No. As a trader doing this methodology, you're waiting. You'd wait till you get below. You had a little move to the upside, but you definitely only want to accum accumulate your inventory below value because you know that the overall market move, the sustained market move, is to the upside. So everything below value, as long as these daily traders hold their positions, everything below value becomes an opportunity for you. And your minimum upside as you navigate these pullbacks, as long as they're below value, your minimum upside is coming back to value. That's where you should have your minimum profit target getting, uh, to, to, uh, um, to expect. Now you might be saying, well, how do you how do you manage your stop loss? Well, you can look at the price action below value. You could see when it looks like it's tiring out. Or if you want a simple method, you can look at how far are you away from established value. So let's say that you're 20 pips below value. Well, your stop loss can start at 20 pips from where you get in or, or, or your entry price. If it's 20 pips away, put your stop loss at 20 pips and you start with a one to one ratio. Now you don't have to keep it that way as price moves in your favor, you can tighten it up, but that's a starting point. Another thing you can look for is previous contraction points, previous market framework. You can see that this pullback had a reaction from there. Because the contraction points build the real structure of the market, those give you all the significant bounce points, especially within a big, a big trending move. So you could have used that as well. So there's many ways to do it and it takes practice. But the point is, when you know where the sustained move is, is going on the higher time frame, this becomes much, much easier and your confidence goes way, way up. So you enter here, your minimum upside is value. You can see that we got right through value and it held above. Now you're, it's all gravy after here. In fact, when you get above value, you can move your stop loss to, to a, a minimum profit and then just see what the trade gives you. But we had more right here. We had another value line established here and here. You can see we had price action below, took out liquidity. Remember, that's that short-term 15-minute traders getting stopped out. And you have 15-minute traders starting to short the market. That is 15-minute dumb money creating opportunity for you. You do the opposite. You're undervalued, so you know you're, you're in a good place. Boom. The daily kicks in, carries that market move up. Now here's a more extended, a little more extended move down. You can see we got another value point established right here. Are you going to buy here? Nope. It's above value. You're waiting for it to come down. 
come down. You can see we test value, you bounce off. It works its way all the way back and you can see that it reacts off the previous value point. This is what we, it's a pattern that we call in, in our advanced training in our course, we call this walking up the ladder. It's holding previous market structure. So we can see it comes down, holds that structure, and then what happens? This one didn't get through value, it did for a brief second. When this one did, that's when the higher time frame, the daily players kicked in, boom, absolute explosion. And then that's where we're at right now. You can see that even coming below value, how, how magnetic those points are. And that is why, that is why it's so important for you guys to learn to map out those value points to, to give yourself the framework of where the market is gonna be uh, gravitationally pulled to. So again, even to this point right now, being undervalued is still um, paying you, even though the market's generally flat. But you wanna be careful as you get higher and higher in this market cycle, because what's happening over here? Is dumb money starting to become active? Right. Dumb money is now starting to chase this market on the daily time frame. Now it could break out if the higher time frames like the weekly and the monthly come in. That can remember daily you can get rewarded for chasing the market every once in a while. So it could continue to break out, but you want to be careful because now dumb money is getting involved in your higher time frame and that could mean that your lower time frame will stop paying you. You could see the daily rotate. So it might be better for a short opportunity here pretty soon, coming back to value on daily. Now that you know this, and you know the cycles, and you're gonna be practicing with this, you can forecast those moves. And these moves are things that most people don't know about and could never even see. So by now you probably understand the basics of how this strategy works, but just so I know you're perfectly clear, I wanna take you through it in a little bit more detail. So we're gonna start over here on the left side with our higher time frame chart. Remember, this is the chart that you use to forecast the market, to make predictions about overall direction. So as right now, you can see that the, your higher time frame is in a box. It's in that contraction phase. And you basically do not wanna trade in that phase. Now we do have a methodology to trade a ranging market uh, in, our, in our advanced training, but that's a little bit harder to do. I'm trying to keep this very, very simple so you have a very easy way to get started with this methodology and make it work for you. So we're gonna focus on trending markets. Trending markets start right here on the expansion. And the definition of expansion is simply leaving the box. There are a few different types of expansions that happen, meaning there's a, a direct breakout expansion and there's also multi-leg expansions. Right now, the, the one you're gonna encounter the most is gonna be a multi-leg expansion for, for the most part. So we're gonna keep it based on that. So the moment you get a breakout out of a box, this signals that higher time frames are becoming active and this is basically game time. This is telling you, hey, volatility is hitting the market and it's gonna start swinging. And if your higher time frame chart starts swinging and opening up, that means there's gonna be opportunity on the lower time frame chart. So the market breaks out of the contraction box and goes up and it didn't last very long. What happened right here? Well, we had a weekend reversal. Why did this happen? It's because price went up Weak hands jumped in, the dumb money jumped in, and higher time frames than them, the, the, the strong, stable money, didn't pile in as well. And so when it's left in the hands of shorter, shorter term weak hands, it's gonna collapse and crumble back to value. And that's exactly what happened. But if you can spot this, if you know that this is, is happening or it's likely to happen, then this opportunity right here, this is a new trend sweet spot. If you see this happening on your higher time frame chart, that is a great spot to start looking at your lower time frame chart for the opportunity to short the market, uh, especially if you're trading um, Forex. Very easy to short the market. So this would be a great strategy for that. So right here, at this point, you'd be looking for the market to go short, at least back to value. Um, as you can see, it went a lot further than that. But let's look at, at what else happened in the progression. So right here, when we got below value, it got hung up on value for a, a few candles there. But when it got below, now you're starting to get into where the higher time frames are likely going to pile on. So in that case, you have another sweet spot, but this one's risk controlled by value. If your higher time frame confirms under value, 
then even as you trade on the lower time frame, you can decide that if the higher time frame goes back above that value point that you'll get out of the market. So that becomes a great place to, to control risk really tight on your overall higher time frame. So as this goes down, one thing you need to be more and more careful of is that it could end. The farther you move away from value, remember now you're starting to get weak hands selling in. You could be stopping out uh, past buyers depending on um, depending on the structure of the market. But either way, you got weak hands coming into the market. The farther that, that they go, the more traders see it's happening. Happening. Remember, seeing is believing. They're jumping in, they're getting stopped out from previous positions. That's bringing weak hands into the market and that's where you can suffer a reversal. So remember that if you look at a move and it's already gone 10, 20, 30 candles gone, um, then I'm not saying don't trade it. What I'm saying is don't bet the farm on it. Be very careful because eventually you will get a, at least a pause in the trend or a full-blown reversal. As this market goes down from that new trend sweet spot at the top turn, what are you looking to do on your lower time frame? Okay, on your lower time frame chart, the market starts going down. We have that contraction zone that gives us that the start of framework that we can manage the opportunity around. So this is really what you're looking for. You're looking for price action that gives you a value line with a contraction. It breaks out and then expands up above. This is ideal. Now there's other ways that you can also manage risk on direct breakouts because some of these boxes go directly back into trend. Um, that can happen. But this is the ideal setup because th this one is the most forgiving and it allows you also to make the most am amount of profit uh, in most of these situations. So as the market goes up, you want to accumulate your inventory above value. So you can see it represented by the, by the arch there. In that general area, you want to accumulate whether it's just one position um, where you're trying to, to find the best entry yourself or if you're not totally sure how far it's going to go, then you could also break up your overall position into multiple positions and build that inventory. That's where we talk about using smaller positions so that you can stay flexible. It's really, really important you stay flexible in this period so that you can actually see a profit. If you trade too big a size right here, there's a good chance that you're gonna get stopped out because you're not gonna have the pain tolerance to watch it go negative. And believe me, you're gonna misjudge these quite often, so you need to, to take caution and prepare for that. It's going to happen, but you will get better over time the more experience you get. Okay, now as price comes back to value, your minimum upside is coming back to value, but ideally, if your overall higher time frame direction stays intact, you really want to try to liquidate at value or below. That's the best. Because as you go below, what's happening on the lower time frame? That dumb money is rushing in. Uh, the the supply is rushing into the market. They're, they're all selling. And that's what you want to actually sell into that strength. So, or I apologize, you want to buy back into that strength because you'll be closing out your sell orders. So while they're selling, they're rushing into the market that you're buying, you're doing the opposite of them. So you wanna liquidate your inventory into that declining market under value. So now we're gonna look at the opposite. Now the same move, this move turned into that multi-leg expansion, that classic funneling out action. And what, what ended up happening there? We did get that weekend reversal. So if you were shorting, you have to be careful. You're undervalued, it did go into a turn. But the turn's good, because that provides us with another one of those new trend sweet spots that great place to start getting interested in your lower time frame to try to find an actual entry opportunity. You're so close to the turn at these spots that the risk is traditionally pretty minimal. So this just it's a great place to start getting interested uh, in an in a overall direction change. This also came up through value and provided us with another risk controlled sweet spot. Um, not as good as the initial bottom turn, but it's, it's decent. Uh, this one popped off pretty fast, so there actually wasn't much opportunity on this specific one. Um, but you do want to watch that point because it could you could get great opportunities around that value point. And then at the top, remember, you're, you're starting to enter into overvalued territory. You're going to have weak hands jumping in. If those higher time frames don't come in and bail them out, you're going to collapse back to value again. So you always want to be aware of that. Hopefully by this time you racked enough uh, enough profits from the initial turn at the bottom to where you've earned the right to just keep trading it for what, it, what for all it's worth. But 
if this is where you're starting on the trend and you already missed all those opportunities, you definitely want to be careful. So on your lower time frame entry chart, it's basically the same thing as shorting, just reversed. You have your value point that gives you the framework. You want to accumulate your inventory under value, and then you want to sell it into the rise. You want to liquidate your inventory as you get above value. And re remember, your minimum upside is always at the value level. So you're just trying to get from where you, where you accumulate to value. That's your minimum profit target. And then when you get up above, that's where it's gravy. And you're just want to going to want to try to do the best you can uh, with riding it as long as you can. That's that's just where time, experience, you know, that's where that comes in. Now, I know I've spoken about how important the higher time frame is, but I just want to go over this just to really drive it home. OK, the higher time frame is your key to predicting the future. When you accurately forecast the future of your higher time frame, trading on the lower time frame becomes easy. The key is to try and develop a bias to one side of the market. This will not only make your life easier, but it will also keep prof probability in your favor and your win rate high. Do a good job analyzing the cycle on your higher time frame, and the lower time frame will take care of itself. I can't emphasize this enough. Start with the, that higher time frame. Get good at watching the cycles and predicting the turns, watching them as they happen. If you do a good job watching that higher time frame and understanding it, the lower time frame becomes easy. Now, I told you in the beginning that this methodology works on anything that is heavily traded. Cryptocurrencies, gold, silver, uh, Forex, stocks. As long as there's enough trading volume and enough people participating, this pattern will emerge. So... Let's take a few minutes and look at, at, at a few more charts and a few more asset classes. Here's Ethereum against the dollar. Let's just take a quick moment and just see what we see on this chart. Here's the monthly and here's the daily. What's the monthly look like? Well, our last established, heavily established value is way down at $200, okay? Now, I'm not going to say that Ethereum's going to go down to $200. I cannot tell the future. But what I can tell you is that there is a possibility that the market in a severe crash situation can come down there because that's where established value is. So the question is, is how much of this move up is weak holders? How much of it is? Because the if, if there's weak holders up here, they're gonna be the first to drop when they see the, the price coming down, right? So that's really the question. Now the, the price can oscillate th uh, in this area right here and establish a new value and that would be a good sign for holding the value up but it hasn't as of yet when it comes to the monthly time frame now let's look over here at the daily time frame this right here the value inside the daily time frame these boxes uh, with their expansion lines and, and, and the established value lines give us insight into what's happening inside these monthly candles so the last really great opportunity was right here when we established value on the daily drop below. That was the, the discounted liquidity on the shorter time frame compared to the monthly. Accumulate there, got up through value. You can see that it held. That's a great sign. And that puts you into this run. Now, how long you stayed in would have been up to you. That's different for everyone. But we're just trying to get from undervalued to back into overvalued so that we can sell the supply that we accumulated down here to the dumb money. Same as the smart money, institutional traders, market makers, whatever you want to call them, they're accumulating supply and selling it into that new demand overvalue. Now let's look at what happened here. We got below value right here. So this possibly would have been an opportunity to get back in. It got above, but it didn't hold. Uh-oh. Well, what's up with that? And then we got below again. Maybe you bought again down here, and now it's starting to hold below the framework. That is a clue that the market is, is running into weakness. Because if, if it wasn't, it would have got up through value and went on another run. So this is another example of how establishing market framework, true market framework, gives you clues to make decisions with. At this point, whatever you accumulated in here under value, you maybe would have got rid, gotten rid of it right here because the market is not behaving the way it should if it still had strength. Very simple. Then you drop down here. It holds below value, giving you a further clue. This is what we call walking down the ladder in our advanced training. There's walking up the ladder. This is walking down the ladder. 
If you accumulate it again and it's starting to hold, that's showing you that it's confirming weakness. And then we had the market collapse and it pulled the monthly around with it. So you can see by how having market framework properly organized on your screen can give you these little clues that others aren't paying attention to. And that could be the difference between getting wrecked or not or doing great. And it's easier said than done. This doesn't make trading easy by any means, but at least now you're looking at the markets the proper way. Now let's look at the equities markets. This is ticker symbol DWAC, and this one I actually happen to have kind of a small position in, but uh, it's an active position. And this actually was found by someone on my team. Um, it was an opportunity that they were they were scanning for different things and uh, presented it to the group. And we thought, oh, that's that could be decent uh, decent opportunity. So we actually presented this opportunity to our subscribers on one of our webinars. And so far, it's it's actually going great. But let's talk about the technicals of what happened. Right here, we have the monthly time frame. You see the monthlies obviously climbing up. This is a relatively uh, new new stock to the market. So there's not a whole lot of price action. So this we're basically just going off of the monthly direction. Um, and the monthly direction by itself can be very strong, uh, regardless of framework, because uh, it is a long time frame uh, for active traders. So we're simply going off of that. We had established market value right here. Uh, you could see, and then we came below that market value. So you can see that it came up, came through there, and then settled out right here. We made the call to start looking at it right about here. I forget exactly which day it was. And it was based on the monthly being pointed up. We think that the momentum's coming in. There was some research done behind this on a fundamental level. Um, that's something that would be different, which we'll talk about later when we go over the rules for this whole thing. Um, there was research done to, to justify the overall narrative of taking this trade in this particular stock, but the framework was also reasonably fa favorable. You can see that the market was really tight, tightening up into an overall contraction period, and this didn't take any rocket scientists to, to see that this. You could see that, that it was tightening up, um, and it was possibly headed for a big breakout. We were biased to it breaking out to the long side because of the fundamentals and because of the monthly chart being up so the idea was we we when it, when it was right here we said start looking at this wait for it to start moving a little bit um it started moving here i actually entered my position right here on the tail of that daily candle wick that was where i entered my initial position but as i got profit on the trade i actually uh, added more to it uh, as it was going so that's why my average is up here and we set our risk management with what we have to work with it wasn't perfectly ideal by any means but we did have this minor framework box right here. And we says you wanna watch your risk on that lowest framework in this overall range. And you could see sure enough on that day it broke out, held right there, I saw it holding right there and I bought right before it came back up and I was managing risk based off of uh, right here after we reacted to that level. Um, that's where I initially did it. Now I've, I've moved my, my risk management to above break even, so worst case scenario, uh, I'll get out at break even, um, and the idea is to ride the trade to the you know to the active high up here around you know 174 dollars or so, and then see what happens from there. Um, right now I'm just kind of in the money, and I'm hoping that we we maintain above value. But from a technical perspective, what's happening is that you know I'm expecting hopefully the long time frames will kick in, but dumb money on the di the the daily time frame is starting to get the opportunity. To enter this market so i am aware of that and that's why i'm protecting my downside what i'm hoping and this is trading you we don't really know what's going to happen but i'm hoping that that higher time frame that stable direction is going to kick in and then we're going to revisit these highs that would be awesome again i cannot tell the future i have no idea what's what's going to happen but what i did know is based on the framework right here i had the opportunity for a strong risk controlled entry with a great potential upside and that's what it is. And you can see, like I said, it's a small position. I'm up like $2,100. I think I saw, it actually had a big pullback today. I, I was up like 3,200 on it or something. But, you know, if it works out, it'll probably, you know, if it goes up to the high, it could be like a $14,000 to $15,000 trade, um, which like I said, is, is decent. It's worth messing around with and, you know, we'll see how it goes. But anyway, um, that's it. So hopefully you could learn something from 
that situation there. And you could see how this methodology is the same, whether it be Forex, it's the same in crypto, and it's the same in stocks, as long as there is enough, va uh, enough volume. You could see down here where we had low volume, you're not getting a lot of framework. But once the volume comes in, the eyeballs start coming to that particular stock or cryptocurrency or whatever, it starts moving around and creating these patterns. And that's what we base the framework off of. The last thing I want to quickly take a look at is Facebook stock or pardon me, Meta Platforms Inc. <laughs> so real quick, if we look over at the daily right here, where's our last value established? Well, according to our software, like I said, it does this algorithmically. Uh, the last major value line triggered right here. We had multi-leg expansion, swing low. There's one, swing high, two, swing low, three. And then we didn't quite break the swing high point. So technically it's a three leg, three uh, multi-leg expansion. Came down, held below value, uh, came back up, tested value, settled, and then literally off of the value point, had that huge break to the downside that rattled everyone that's holding Facebook stock, right? So that shows you how sensitive that line is to, to the fact that that's exactly where it tested before it broke short. But I want to concentrate over here on the monthly real quick. Same thing right here. We have a red box, swing high, swing low. There's that funneling out action going on. And here it comes up. Now, would you say that this was overvalued based on the fact that value is right here? Did you know that all through up here? And I'm not saying money couldn't have been made. Um, and you know, you could trade even in these. Uh, th th there's a lot of opportunity on the lower time frames because you know that the stock is starting to get more and more in control uh, of, um, of dumb money. And the thing with, with dumb, mo dumb money too is it acts irrationally and it'll keep pushing up prices like crazy. Um, so as long as you understand that's who's in control, then you you know you understand the game. You understand, you know, what, what, what the possibilities are. And that's really what's playing out right now. Value based on the monthly time frame, is still down here. So when this happened, this panic sell right here, and Facebook had this big fundamental change they went through, the weak hands are all up here. They've been investing over in, into an overvalued market. So this is merely... This, I don't know how far it's going to end up going. I mean, it may collapse Facebook. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But from a technical standpoint, this broke so hard because you have a lot of weak hands at the top right here. Uh, and it's going to find home back around value. It's very likely this is going to fall back into this range. Even if it ends up bouncing, that's where it's going to be gravitationally pulled to because that's where the market decided value was a long time ago. Now, if we had a new red box up here with a new white line and price had had confirmed value up higher, then this may not be happening. It may have just been whipping up around in that area. But the fact that this is the last established value is a reason why price is comfortably crashing down to that level because that's where it is. Everybody up here is going to have weaker hands than the people down here. These were the really smart people that had the foresight to accumulate. These are the people that are just trying to ride it for all it's worth. And up here are the really poor suckers that got that got suckered into this. And those are going to be, like I said, the first to collapse. So hopefully you can look at this because this is in the news right now. And you look at this with, whole different, with, with a whole new perspective now. There's nothing... You know, what, what is rocking Facebook investors and, you know, they're trying to cope with this. This is just another day in the market for you. There's nothing special about what's happening here other than it was overvalued. You had a market catalyst that was unfavorable news. Remember uh, from the, the circle diagram, unfavorable news causes price to go down, dumb money panic sells and things uh, go to the equilibrium level, which is value. Now, because I know traders love rules, I'm going to give you some. Actually, they're more like guidelines, but you want to pay attention because these are going to keep you on the right track. These are good guidelines. So for your chart setup, you want to use a minimum of two time frames to trade with, one for your higher time frame cycle and direction, and one for your lower time frame cycle and entry. 
Recommended time frame pairings are the five minute or the 15 minute into the four hour as your higher time frame, the 15 minute or the one hour into the daily as your higher time frame, the one hour or the four hour into the weekly as your higher time frame, or the four hour or the daily into the monthly. If you're trading Forex, major cryptos, or major indices and stocks, it is recommended that you focus on one or two assets or pairs. Become a specialist. This is really important. Uh, a lot of people that come through our program and that we work with directly, one of the main things we have to fix is them looking at too many things. What ends up happening when you look at so many different symbols or instruments or cryptos, whatever it is you're trading, you be, you you don't trade any of them really well. Now, the only difference to this is if you're actually chasing pump and dumps like penny stocks or something, that's where you're just chasing these specific one-off opportunities. But if you're trading something with heavy volume that actively trades every day, you really want to focus on those asset classes and, and become a specialist in that because the more time you spend with that market, the better you're going to get at feeling things out. So that's really important to the success of this. You want to keep other indicators and distractions to a minimum. Keep your charts clean. Can't tell you how many, how many times people send into our support uh, pictures of charts and they have 14 other indicators on there. It's like you can't even see anything through there. How can you look at the, the simplicity of the market cycles when it's clouded by 20 indicators, right? So keep your charts clean and simple. Position sizing and risk. Position sizing is ultimately up to you. We're not going to tell you what to do. However, we do recommend you not risk more than 1% to 2% of your account on any single opportunity. Just good money management. You want to be around to trade another day after a bad day. And we all have bad days every once in a while. So use good money management. Another thing is you want to keep your position small so you could be creative. If you're practicing this methodology right, most of your trades will put you into the money at some point as long as you don't choke them off with too tight a stop loss. If you're trading too big, too heavy, if you misjudge the entry even a little bit, you're going to want to close out that trade and you're not going to give it the rope it needs to pay you. So keep that in mind. And you can always add to your positions. Even if you're, you start uh, an opportunity with one small position, if it goes against you but the overall idea is still intact, it's still a good good opportunity. It just pulled back a little more than you thought. Then you can shoot another bullet at it. And then as it goes for you, shoot another one. You can build that inventory. That keeps you flexible and it keeps you in the game. Let's talk about the news or more specifically how we view news when using this methodology. Markets need active and willing participants to move price. We need people active in these markets. Otherwise, nothing happens. News events are the catalyst that brings attention to stocks, cryptocurrencies, and Forex markets. Those are the advertising campaigns to bring in people with opinions on price who execute orders. There's two basic types of news, planned news and unplanned news. Other than in a flash crash or catastroph catastrophic type situation, all news should be thought of as fuel to the market. When news is released, the master pattern, what you've been learning right now, the master pattern does not change. It just speeds things up. Okay, so keep that in mind. The, the pattern, the, the contractions, the expansions, the multi-leg expansions, everything you've been learning just gets sped up because it's getting more fuel when news is dumped on a market. How to trade the news. Don't trade the news, <laughs> at least at the release. Wait it out and let the master pattern phases guide you into a good trade. You can sit through a planned news event if you already have a significantly profitable position. You've earned the right at this point to see what happens, especially if you think it'll push the markets in your favor. A good example of this is if you're an intraday trader or you're planning on being in a trade for multiple uh, days or weeks, if you're already sitting up 50, 100, 200 pips for, let's say, if you're trading Forex, then you've earned the right to ride through, let's say, non-farm payroll or GDP numbers. You've earned that right because you already have money in the bank. Whereas if you aren't in the market and or you're in a position and it's at break even, you may want to close out that position before that news comes out because that could be a, a risky spot to be in. For active traders, it's usually best to wait or withdraw completely from the market in the case of a major unplanned event. 
Let the market settle out before you make a new plan. For instance, if a tsunami hits Japan uh, or, or an earthquake, what's that going to do to the yen? Right, you may want to withdraw from that market, or if you have, we have a situation like COVID came out, you remember what it did uh, to the Dow Jones, the the U.S. 30, um, we had a big dip. So unplanned news events can cause these gut reactions in the market uh, that can really move price. Now, when that stops, the price will settle back into the master patterns, but there could be a big gap move, and you do want to be careful in those kinds of situations. Just to quickly drive this home with a brief example, here's a look on how the progressive rollout of information regarding the spread of COVID-19 affected the markets, specifically the EURUSD weekly chart. Here's a snapshot of that actual price action. So right here in late January 2020, Trump issues a travel ban to China. The markets react. It's getting serious, right? By March 2020, COVID-19 becomes a worldwide household name Markets keep reacting. You can see the volatility just building. It's going up, down. Uh, to most people, this would just be a crazy, unpredictable market, right? By May 2020, the world settles on the new reality it's facing. Markets respond to a longer-term outlook, and then we start getting some st some stable movement uh, after that crazy whipsaw-type movement. Now, what really happened here? Look at that. We had all this news, and this was even unplanned news at the start, but what did it turn into? It turned into a classic multi-leg expansion formation. All that news didn't change the patterns overall. People are, people are still buying the market. People are still selling the market. Their pain thresholds are getting pushed, forcing them out of the market. They're chasing the market. Everything that forms this pattern is still happening with all that news and that news the COVID-19 reaction news just is fuel to the market and I'm going to leave you with that burning the markets down <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the training there's a lot of information in this training so feel free to watch it more than once and give yourself time for it to sink in it's going to take practice and patience to really get this down if you want more information about what we do at Trade ATS including information on our software visit our website at tradeats.com you can also join our mailing list and get access to trade ideas. And we also have free courses there too. So feel free to check that out. And if you like our content here on YouTube, remember to like and subscribe.